Welcome back to the BDGE Dynasty Fantasy Football Only channel. You might be watching it from the Redraft channel. If so, you should probably head over to the Dynasty channel and subscribe there because we're going to stop posting to the Redraft channel within a couple weeks. So if you are in Dynasty Leagues, go subscribe there. If you want to join a Dynasty League, we are also setting those up for you in the Discord link down below. I am joined by my beautiful co-hosts with even more Hi. beautiful BDGE shirts, as you can see, we're rocking them crispy, fresh, and beautiful. And we're going to give away three of them to y'all out there in the audience. Simply subscribe to the Dynasty channel of BDGE. More importantly, subscribe to the Dynasty channels of Adam and Andrew linked down below. Those will be the first three links that you see. So subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. You did a few subscribe subscriptions, and now you are entered in to win a free BDGE t-shirt. Boys look good. Crispy. Hey. Hang. And we're checking. Oh, and the we, rules. Oh, we, we know you're counting every subscriber you got I'm, over I'm there. I'm counting them all. So today, hopefully, you're into Dynasty already. If you're not and we can get you into Dynasty, then this video is perfect for you because we are going to go through around 10, maybe-ish, uh, uh, mistakes that we see beginner Dynasty players make. And this will help the veterans too, I think, just because, you know, more often than not, you're in a couple leagues, but you have you don't have enough experience to really go through everything that happens in the dynasty league. Because there, are, you know, you got to be in a league for five, seven, eight years to really see things through to understand the process of dynasty. Because it's a whole different game to redraft. So again, today's video: mistakes that we see new dynasty players make. Andrew, I'm gonna let you hey. riff first. Yeah, man. I, I was thinking about when you asked me what type of mistakes do new dynasty managers make. I mean, who better to ask? Right. Yeah, he asked Some the guy who made dumbass. all the mistakes before. Yeah. I think the first mistake that I made when I first started playing Dynasty is not understanding that the relationships that you build in the trade market, in the trade rooms, last, and those first impressions last for a long time. Mm. So when you're out here trying to stack the deck, you know, throw together some BS offers to go get yourself some really good players... The next time that they get that trade offer in their inbox from you, they're going to say, Andrew always sends me bad trades. I'm just declining this trade. I don't want. I don't even want to look at it. Especially if you're in leagues with people that you don't know yet. Like you're in a league with maybe the six strangers and six of your homies. Like you send that type of shit to strangers. You send like, look at the trade you send beforehand and ask yourself if you got sent that shit, how would you feel? Because also what might happen is maybe they, maybe they'll turn it down and be like, ah, whatever, you know, make a mental note. But what happens is, like, someone puts a player on the trade block. They're like, hey, I'm looking to trade Lamar Jackson. Maybe they get two trades in their inbox that are kind of even, one from you and one some, from some guy they like. Who are they going to hit the fucking accept button on? Guy they like. Or even worse is it's going to be, like, they see you put somebody up on the trade block, and they're like, his trades are always unreal unrealistic anyways. He Not wants to get this. Yeah. He wants to get a, you know, arm and a leg for this guy. I don't even want to send an offer. And, and that is damaging because – in Dynasty, when you're keeping these teams for long periods of time, you know, hypothetically forever, you are going to have to at some point start selling assets, rebuilding, doing things like that. And when it comes time to do that, if you've built bad relationships along the way, it's going to be that much harder for you to fix a team. What have you done in your past? What, why, did, why did this come up for you? What did you do to someone? Or just yesterday. There is a <laughs> league specifically where I went in, I was, you know, trying to get the upper hand. I did a few times. You know, you make a couple of good trades. They go your way. Mm -hmm. Won a couple of championships. And now I'm like public enemy number one. It's like nobody wants to trade with me. You won championships. You didn't offer us good trades. And you robbed us in those trades that you did make. So we don't want anything to do with you. And I think that that's like my first air of caution that I would give new managers is do not end up like me in that situation. Because when it does come time for me to tear it down – they're going to give me hell. Yeah. Sounds like he played himself. Yeah. I played myself. But you. I won two championships, so who really won? Yeah, you're right. You're right. Championship. Who won? Salutes everything. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It, I could retire from there and be fine. Facts. I will go off of that based on trading because trading is so relevant in Dynasty. And especially if y'all are new, the startup draft is the first thing that you're going to do. And you got your pick at the 103. You take Jalen Hurts, take Josh Allen, whatever. And then the dude up at 107, 108 says – hey, does anybody want this pick? And you're like, yeah, of course I want the fucking pick because I can grab Lamar Jackson or Jamar Chase or whoever it is. The shiny players up there are shiny, but good Lord, do they cost you. 
an arm and a leg. And if you're new to Dynasty and you're not really sure about trade values, they're going to take you for everything you have. Your firstborn, your first round pick in 2024, probably a second, a third round pick in the startup draft. And before you know it, you just gave off all your depth. You just gave off probably the ability to have like your quarterback two in super flex, any luxury picks, like stacking up the middle rounds of a startup draft, like the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh round picks are beautiful because everyone takes different strategies. So by the time you get to like, you think in your mind, I'm coming from redraft, seventh round picks and eh, shitty players in startups, like you're getting solidified veterans that will produce for you at a high level in year one and two, but they're dropping to seventh and eighth because they're older and people value youth. So like those middle round picks are not worth the middle round picks of redraft leagues. Like, and if you're going up for your first, a second first round pick, like, cool, you'll have two really good players, but you, you normally dynasty leagues are start 10, start 11. You're going to have trouble getting real players into your lineup after Agreed. that. Agreed. And I would say you want to find the studs in dynasty, right? So if you have that many bites in those middle rounds at the apple to find that stud, yep. you're just going to shoot a higher percentage. Yeah. And, and basically what what will happen, you won't understand when you first start playing, but you'll give up all your flexibility by doing that, right? So you lose your first round pick and you don't understand that the variance can hit you even if you've drafted what you think are great players. Injuries happen, down years happen. All of a sudden, you have a team that you thought was going to do well, is not doing well. You don't have your first-round pick, and you have no idea what you're supposed to do. And that's how teams can really get set back. I would go as far as saying, without a doubt, I would rather have no first-round picks and have traded back to get a, a haul in the middle of the draft than have two first-round picks or multiple first-round picks. Like I would much rather be outside of the top 12 picks but have – two-thirds, two-fifths, two-sixths, a future first next year. So it's fine not having a first-round pick because the depth is equally as important, if not more so. No, Very you. much. Yeah, I think I think one thing that um, that you have to realize is, like, when, when you first start playing, you don't necessarily realize – and it, it's very frustrating, I think. When you start trading, right, everyone's excited. You want to get a trade done, right? You want to have something happen right then and there. But a lot of times, people end up getting hung up on the details, right? And a trade doesn't actually happen. So – Nick and I, let's say we're, we're debating because Andrew's, you know, trying to fleece everybody. We I, already established that. We're debating. He's yapping. Yeah, he's yapping. He's trying to sell me all <laughs> these terrible plays. Shit. Get out of here. You know, we don't you want, want my that. Jared Stidham. <laughs> let's say Nick and I are t talking about a trade. We're really close, but we just – we both want to get over on each other too bad. We don't make a trade. And we, you leave from that kind of frustrated. And I think one of the things that's most important to remember, if you are going to play in a league and be active, you're not always going to get a trade done just because you start discussing a trade. And one thing that you can really take away from that is every time I'm, I'm talking with Nick or if I actually decide to trade with Andrew or somebody else, take a piece of what was happening there and remember that. So now, okay, I know Nick wanted my Debo Samuel or whatever player it is, and maybe there's an injury that comes up later for Nick, and now I have Debo Samuel to offer him and he needs him more. I can maybe make a trade then. Just because you don't get a trade done today, take a piece of the information that you got today so you can better build on it later. I like that. Bang. Don't be scared to invest in those middle age wide receivers, mm. right? Like I had a dynasty startup draft this off season where I hit on, I, I went all quarterbacks, all running backs for the first like five rounds. My first wide receiver was I think DK Metcalf. And then it was Brandon Ayuk. It was Michael Pittman. I have Christian Kirk on that team. Chris Godwin guys. I even forgot to left. I left out earlier when we were talking about it. And then I hit on, uh, Jaden Reed and tanked out later in the drafts, but like no one wanted the DKs and no one wanted the Iukes because it's like, ah, it's like, are they going to produce their 25, 26 already? I'd rather the 23 year old two rounds earlier where I feel like stacking the number of wide receivers you have, like most people go wide receiver heavy in dynasty drafts, which I think yeah. is the right way to go, but grabbing them at value, you get such high production later on in uh, later on in the startup drafts. And I think you can go with a really, quarterback heavy approach to do that so what what is that age range for you when you say the middle range I know you said 24 25 where is your cutoff so really? this year in particular I'm looking at dudes like T Higgins mm -hmm. Debo DJ Moore DK Metcalf and again Christian Kirk those are all dudes yeah. like 25 to 27 ish that are going to go from rounds five to eight and I'm like yeah. those dudes sure they'll be over the age apex in like three years but you're going to get really solid production for the next three years so yeah. I would I would say though like I like the veterans, but I wouldn't. The guys I would stay away from are like the Mike Evanses, the Keenan Allens, Cooper Cups, even Amari Coopers, Adams. Tyler Lockett's, D Hop, Adams. Yeah, because yeah. those guys are actually like 30 plus years old. Yeah. They fall off the cliff quickly. These other guys, 
they feel old because all the new wide receivers are so fucking young, and yeah. they're like the cream of the crop right now. And, and I want to kind of piggyback off of that, unless you have something in that same yeah. breath. I was just going to say that the best way to think about it, in my opinion, is you, you're going to have, like, you know, the new, young, sexy assets that you want to get. You're going to say you can project this crazy high ceiling because we haven't seen them fail. All the rookies, Jackson Smith and Jigbas, the guys that you're really projecting, Garrett Wilson even, right, Chris Olave, guys in that range that you think are going to have top five upside. Those type of players, they don't have necessarily top five upside, but you don't have to have top five upside from everybody. They, they're unsexy, they're, but they have top 12, top 15 and if you have enough of those guys backfilled with some upside players and you got them at value, like put it like this, in the early parts of the round, like the early rounds, you aren't going to likely win your league in there, but you just are trying to make sure you don't screw those up. You can really win your leagues in the middle rounds. And if you get guys like that at value while everyone's wanting to get, you know, young rookies, you can really do a, a number on your league. Yeah, I, I, I like uh, – you know how in, like, redraft, I feel like people love to put labels on, like, strategies that you have in drafts, where it's, like, hero running back. Yep. You take one running back in the first, and then you kind of fade it forever. Yep. I actually really like the idea of, like, a hero wide receiver for dynasty startups. Like, you grab your C. Lamb or Jamar Chase in the first, and then, like, second, third, fourth are peppered with, like, quarterback, quarterback, tight end, <laughs> then get back to your wide receivers or running back yep. or something like that. Because a lot of the young running backs, the ETNs, the walkers, those guys can be had in the fifth, sixth round, but you can grab – Ayuk in the fifth. You can grab DK in the fourth. You can grab Higgins in the fifth. Shit like that. Yep. That's a great call because there's there's the high end upside guys, but then there really is a lot of volatility from let's say wide yeah. receiver ten to thirty. Honestly, yeah. yeah. Like, do well, you really want Alave that much more than you want DJ Moore or that much more than you want Ayuk? Like, yes, but their production won't be that dissimilar over the next two three and years. Based on their ADP, you're making a pretty big bet on that player. Yeah. Right. And when we get into kind of like. It's not so much for beginner dynasty players, but when you get into war and things like that, you'll realize that the difference between like wide receiver 12 and the difference between wide receiver 24 is really nothing at all. Like yep. they're pretty much the same player. And we were talking about that with your startup that you were just asking us questions about. Like what was the difference between Terry McLaurin and Deontay Johnson? Probably not much. Right. So being mm. able to, you know, decipher that and make those decisions is going to be beneficial. And I, I want to go piggybacking off of that almost in the same direction, but just a little bit different. And that's, people overvaluing the rookie pick, overvaluing the youth. And I've seen in Dynasty Leagues before where people will go in and they'll say they have the 107 in a rookie mock or uh, whatever it is, and they end up saying, well, I want that instead of Tyreek Hill. I want that instead of DK Metcalf. And, and being able to think that that rookie pick is going to guarantee itself as a young stud. We know just from this year in particular, Quentin Johnson and guys like that who – they just don't always pan out. It's a very risky pick to bet on those rookie picks. So when you view those as solidified assets, that's how you can really set yourself back over a long period of I time. I end up trading a lot of my firsts. I've realized for veteran players I could throw into my lineup right away. Because if you look historically at, like, the first over the last 5, 10 years or whatever, it's really fun to go look and be like, uh, the 2017 class, here was the 101 through the 112. Half of them are just are not even in the league anymore. You know what I mean? So it's like yep. people think of their guaranteed picks. So use that in everyone's mind. Again, in Dynasty, people look at players and picks only as upside. No one ever considers downside when they consider trading. So when you're able to move them, you get a player that's actually at that value versus giving away someone who has basically a 50% chance of hitting that value. I like that. I, I think uh, actually to that point, like understanding that typically when you first start playing, I was guilty of this for sure. You have a, you have a draft pick or multiple. And you say, all right, I have the 107, I have the 105. And you start penciling in players that you should be taking there, who you're going to get, right? The reality is you don't have to ever make that pick. You don't have to actually select that. So it's like, it's like having tickets to a game. You have the ticket. Now, you can go if you want to, but you could always sell them for more. You can sell them to somebody else who really wants to go to that game if it's a really valuable game, right? So the biggest thing, I think, is to kind of view picks, understand the players in there, understand you can take them, but – in the cycles of youth movements, understand you don't have to actually press the button there. And like Nick said, you can end up trading all your first for five years, and no one may be the wiser while you're picking up veteran players. I think another one that I've seen before is people not being able to identify where their team is compared to the rest of the league. You know, we, we want to be very critical of our own teams because – like you've said before, Adam, like you don't want to be stuck in the middle. If you're one of those middle teams, you're not getting any better with the youth on your team. You're also not winning any championships. So being able to take the time to identify where you are in your league 
and know when to push the chips in and when to, you know, sit on your roster and see what actually is going to develop. That's very critical in finding dynasty fantasy football success. See, I, I'd actually push back on that. I know a lot of people talk I, about, like... i seen this coming. Yeah, I, a lot of I, people talk about being in the middle. I just want to get in the dance. And I feel like a lot of dynasty teams can. I've won a lot of championships by sneaking in as the sixth seed. I've gone into, like, that league I put up on the screen before, the Go Fade Me League, where I was 12-2 and two in first place, most points, all that shit. I was... I think I, I finished in... I was, I was a champion like two years ago. I finished in like four, uh, ninth place last year. And I'm like, I feel like my team is good enough that I don't have to sell the Christian McCaffrey's, the Tyree Kills, the Austin Eckler's kind of thing. I'm like, I'm finishing the middle, but like really all you got to do is you got to get a little bit of luck and, and push yourself. I, See, I was going to say, I think, I think the like mediator bridge the gap here. I think being in a blend of both of those where you can understand your team and getting back to that flexibility point. So you don't have to have the most points for in your league and be the number one seed and get a bye to win your title, obviously, right? right. Now, that being said, if you, like your Knicks, like you basically saying, I just want to get to the dance, like that's where the trade deadline comes in. So you can say, all right, I have my first round pick. I don't know that I'm the best team yet, but if I get into the playoffs, I can move my first round pick if I want to make myself stronger for this season and actually go for it. But what will happen is if you make, maybe you trade that first away too early, and things go against you, now you put yourself in a really bad spot because you lost your flexibility. Yeah. yeah. So d- you basically don't want to, like, push the chips in too early if you're not actually a strong contender. Now, if you get into the playoff mix and you, like, all right, I think I'm compete with these guys, cool. But I think if you do it too soon, you really put yourself in a position to be at a bad loss. Yeah, and that's that's what I was going to say because I agree with you. You want to get into the playoffs. You I'm just wanna, trying to fucking compete. You know, every, make, I, I don't want to rebuild. I don't want to fucking go down that kind of path. You don't, you don't, you don't, you don't have to go rebuild. We play to win the, the game. I agree. I'm just saying. I Sounds like you disagree. Don't sell your soul. Say it with your chest. To make a run at a championship. If you're selling your soul to make the run of the championship, and now for the next two, three years, you're just paying buy-ins because you sold off your your. That feels franchise. like what you're saying, though. You're saying if it sounds like you're saying sell your soul, sell your team in order to go for the championship. I'm saying compete if you're close to it. You're saying like blow it up. Don't be in the middle. I'm saying if you're in the no, middle, I'm you can saying get in don't the six. push in your chips. If you're pushing in all of those chips at the beginning. And you well, I'm don't not pushing. Know where I'm not pushing in go. the chips, though. I'm just saying, if I got the sixth seed, I'm just going to compete throughout. You're saying I'm gonna blow it no, up. No, no. That's pushing the See, chips. See, that's up. what I'm saying. I'm saying don't make that mistake. We're talking the same language. I'm talking about it from a different angle that you're talking about it. I don't know. Talk Hank? about it. No, you. No, you. No, you. Stop no, that you. yapping. All right. Well, this why is are you yelling? Game. Why are I'm, you? I'm competing. If I'm projected to be the seventh place in my league, I'm going for it. <clears throat> compete, but don't screw your future. In the process of yeah, that, those are two different things. I didn't say yeah. I'm selling my first and shit to go compete. I'm just yeah. saying like if I if I feel like I got a team but that can get into the playoffs, I'm running. That's with it. what I'm saying. I've seen people sell their future to try and make a run, and I'm saying be mm. be cautious about that. Be careful when you do decide dynasty to do is that. Fickle, and I will other, I will also say the fun part about dynasty is that it's long term and it's just a fun ass league type, but that shit will humble you quickly. So if you think you want to trade. You didn't. I promise you, you didn't win that trade. I've never, like, anytime I felt confident about a trade, I look back on it in a year and it's so, it's just so different. It, it, it's never the outcome that you thought it was. So before you start yapping and talking shit, understand that you're probably going to lose that trade a year from now. True. Patience. There's also, I think, understanding kind of a, to the point they were making on, on the opposite end. If you're a team that's in the middle or you think you're close to contending, but you're not sure if you can, you may have a hard time moving this first because people may say, all right, that's a late first. I don't mm-hmm. really want to give that up. Don't be afraid in the moment that you have a chance to actually win because you want to have your future. Go win now if you really can. I think sometimes you'll see people that they kind of just get stuck in the moment. They want to just hold on to their pick. They don't know what they want to do. If you're in a position to contend and win, even if it feels like it's not the greatest trade today, like you said, you may end up feeling like you lost value by sending your first round pick in to try to go win a title. Did you win the title or didn't you? Yep. That trade honestly is irrelevant if you if that's what it takes to secure a title. So don't necessarily become prisoner of the moment and afraid of the future. Make make the trade if it's going to help you win. Here's another mistake that I think people make when they first get in is we've talked about the bumpers and things like that of using trade calculators. Do not rely on those trade calculators as Bible. And for damn sure, do not send me a picture of that trade calculator telling me that that's why I should be accepting this trade. Easiest way for me to deny a trade right there. Like, I, I think, and, and that maybe also gets into a, a topic of etiquette, but it's just 
do not think that because XYZ website or XYZ tool or whatever says that you should be able to make this trade or you should make that trade doesn't mean that you can. And, and it doesn't mean that I'm going to feel the same way about your resources. I will say, though, on that point, if you're a new beginner, like, again, trades are, are really difficult to understand because you have startup picks, you have rookie picks, you have players, and you don't really understand the youth versus the veteran dichotomy yet. The free resources out there for trade calculators – are a great starting point to understand whether or not you are getting absolutely destroyed in the trade. So resources like Keep Trade Cut, FantasyCalc.com, yours, S- SouthHarmonFF.com. Go, we'll get it, <laughs> baby. <laughs> He's just uncomfortable shouting himself out every once in it's a while. It's fine. We'll, we'll free get promo, to it. free no. promo. No, you're working hard for it. It ain't free. All those are good. <laughs> free. All yep. those are there for you to make sure that you're not making a huge fucking mistake. Now again. Yeah. I, I think it's okay to lose a trade in yeah. these fucking stupid value right. point type Correct. tools. If you're not losing by that much and you feel really strongly about a player, <clears throat> it's fine. Just don't send me a picture of that shit. Yeah, facts, yeah. <laughs> don't, don't be sending nudes. I, I, th- I think actually to that point, like when you, when you watch football, you start playing a lot of redraft leagues, you'll, you'll notice every year that there's like cycles that players come in and out of having, you know, a ton of success, like meteoric rises. And it's – Easy to get a uh, prisoner of the moment of, like, someone that you drafted in, let's say, the 8th, ninth, 10th round, and is, like, surging up boards because they're they're valuable. And people are trying to make a trade for them, and you're unwilling to attach from that player in the moment without actually thinking, like, maybe I can make a trade because this player's value is surging. Like, it's, it's basically player attachment to a point where you're not willing to see what the reality is. Of, are they really, is it really realistic for this player to keep up this type of – uh, production, or is it better to sell right now when people are actually coming to try to buy this player from you? Because it's not very often that every player is getting a ton of offers in your DM. So sometimes player attachment can be a detriment too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'd say another mistake too is is not understanding your league's bylaws, rules, calendars, like things like that. Like when do my waivers lock? When do they open up? When is my trade deadline? We've talked about trade deadline before. Like, what are those Never. dates in your league so you know that you're always prepared and making sure that you're doing the things that you're supposed to be doing before they come up? Yeah, like understanding the first waiver wire run. Like, we do it, like, after the rookie <clears throat> draft happens. Yes. And that's when you can get guys that you liked but were fifth, sixth-round picks, but you only have four rounds in your rookie draft. People were getting guys like Puka Nakua after that first round of waivers last year in on their waivers. 100%. And during the summer, like, our leagues, we have – uh, fabs go every Wednesday and only Wednesday throughout the summer. And the summer's a busy time. Everybody's like doing their own shit, sometimes on the vacation. And you might hear a training camp report of like, whoa, this running back's starting to get some buzz with the starters on a Tuesday, Tuesday night or whatever. Like you got to be super conscious of when that stuff hits. Cause like the upside of grabbing a guy that you might use in your lineup that year or uh, that upcoming year is, is so worth like the risk of nothing throughout the summer. Exactly. Yeah, I, I think actually um, th- this this one here is one that I've, I've seen quite a bit. And I think it's hard to understand, but it's basically sunk cost fallacy, especially in startups. So when you first get into Dynasty League, you're going to have a startup, and you may remember, man, I took this guy in the second round, and he's either gets hurt or he's not playing well, and his value is trending down, and you're essentially looking at it as a second-round startup pick, and he's nowhere near that that value anymore the easy way to flip your mindset on that is think about how hyped you get about a seventh round pick that now is second round startup value there you go right like you're now valuing that guy as a like if you if you're trading him you better get second round value vice versa like the seventh round guy moved up to second the second round guy moved down to seventh that's how the, that's how the market works right and if but and if you're always thinking about where you uh took players that are sinking in value where you got them and you want to trade out of that value you're going to end up possibly just having all these sinking ships on your team you're never going to trade. Yep. So you yep. can't you can't always think about what the yesterday's price was. Yesterday's price is not today's price. Hang. Hang. And you got to understand too like at some point every single player in dynasty is going to be worth zero. At some point. So you can choose to get out a year early, two years early, a year late, yep. but the way you decide to do that is going to determine how much value you're going to gain on your teams moving forward. Mm-hmm. And that will also kind of choose how deep of a rebuild sometimes you have to enter or how much you can avoid the rebuild and keep, you know, competing because you got out a year early. The the whole youth versus veteran kind of movement on when I should buy in on guys, sinking ships type of thing. You're going to, people are going to go crazy for youth. People are going to overreact to 
people being old, but I do think there should be basic parameters of like, you know, once once a player does hit 29, sure, there are dudes who can outlast that and have a couple good years after that. But you should be selling probably a year prior to that because every player eventually gets outed. You know what I mean? Like right. there, there is right. something to the the veteran gap there. The 26, 29 range, I think, is great value. You're playing with fire if you're trying to grasp onto anything I after mean, that. Just think of it. Like if going into last year you chose to sell Austin Eckler at that point compared to where you're selling I him right now. Him year, yeah. Like, you are getting so much less value on your teams right now than you would have last so year. So that team I was in first place with when I was like, yeah, I didn't want to sell C-Mac, didn't want to sell T- Tyreek Hill. Guess who else was in that fucking... Austin Eckler's also on yeah. the team. And I'm like, damn, I kind of wish I traded his ass, obviously, yep. but it didn't happen. Yep. And I, I, I do It's also okay to go ride players into the sunset. I'm also yeah. a, such a fan of that. Like, if, if you're new to Dynasty, man, like, I had Julio on some of my teams, and I'm like... Julio, the drop off just happened fast. Like it just is what it is. I, I rode with the good years, and I'm choosing to do that right now with Stefan Diggs. Everybody has pretty much put his value into oblivion after yep. what has happened last year. But to me, it's like it's gotten so low that it's like I might as well ride into the sunset with Diggs. Yeah, on like my it's roster. okay to, for, yeah. for that to happen. Kelsey's another. Example I missed the, of that, I think. the sell high window, so I'll just ride it out into the sunset. Bulky. Yeah. Hank. yeah. Actually, to, to that point too, Hank. Uh, <laughs> the you can start to tell when you start making trades with people in your league. All right, Nick really wants this player off of my team and you're getting constant offers and maybe you're just declining, declining, declining. Think about what price point you'd actually be willing to move almost every player on your team. Like just kind of assess that. I'm not saying you have to move every player on your team or you need to be willing to move every player on your team, but really kind of visualize what that looks like for yourself. Sometimes you'll just reject trades because you just, I don't want to trade this player. Well, it's kind of interesting. I've seen in a bunch of my leagues and you probably see it all the time too. I think it's actually Tarek who does this like, uh, on Sleeper, you can give every player a nickname. <clears throat> yep. And people will go in and attach a price to every Auto player. Auto accept trade block. Pretty much, yeah. So every player will have like an early, like Patrick Mahomes might have like three first. It might literally say in parentheses three first. Stephon Diggs might have like late first. Uh, Jaden Reed might have early second or <laughs> yep. something like that. And you put a player for that for every name. So that way, like if you were, if you want people to send you trades, they know in rookie value what to send you. But also you could send players that are equivalent to whatever that rookie pick is. Yeah. Right. And I, and. I know we keep talking about different mistakes that people make in trades, but we've said it's so big in your dynasty fantasy football leagues that you're going to have to keep doing that. But I think also paying attention to your league mates tendencies, like there's going to be different types of players or different types of assets that your league mates are going to value more than somebody else in your league, or maybe they value them more than you do in your league. Mm -hmm. So you know who to go to for specific assets. Like I know there's players in my league that, prefer like those pure route runner type of wide receivers. So like, I'm not going to be able to sell him a Mike Evans. He doesn't like that type of wide receiver. Yeah. But if I have a Devonte Smith or a Stefan Diggs, he may like that a lot more than somebody else. So knowing what to come with in the trade room is going to help get those deals done even sooner. In startup drafts, I will say, because we're always preaching super flex here, your startup draft is super flex. There is usually no cheaper time to get quarterbacks than in your startup draft. Ain't and they're, easy to move afterwards because a lot of people forego them. If you're in a new league, a lot of people are going to let quarterbacks dip, right? You guys yep. haven't really played in Superflex Dynasty Leagues. You'll be able to get really good players in the second, third, fourth round. It's I'm fine. If you go five rounds in and you have four awesome quarterbacks, perfect, because you could trade the shit out of them afterwards. Once you leave that startup draft, it is hard to acquire starting quarterbacks. Like, you can get Daniel Jones in the seventh, eighth round. Like, I'm all in on those picks, even if my starters are already filled up. I agree. Yeah, to, to Tendency's point, actually, um, like when you either consume content like this or you're looking at websites and you're looking at data, understand your league is not played in a vacuum. So you'll talk about, you know, this player is worth this and that. In your market, it may not even be close to that. And when you look at players' tendencies, I've seen plenty of times, and I've done this myself, and I'm like, why am I doing this? You'll be in a league, and you're trying to trade off of someone on Nick's team. Let's say it's Nick. He's but Nick, you can look at transactions. Nick doesn't make trades. Like you can spend a bunch of time literally there. just spending, sending trade offers, and they're not getting accepted. And it's unlikely that Nick is going to trade, or he's not a high volume trader. Like, kind of understanding where to put your time too, I think, is a way to not be frustrated. And not that you shouldn't be trading Nick, who doesn't trade a lot, but make sure when you do put a trade in his inbox, it's worth his while. Right, and, and basically understand that, like it. If you don't make it worth his while, he probably isn't going to accept it. So right. don't waste your time with stuff right. like that. Yeah. It's right. funny how, like, Dynasty Leagues usually it, – it takes a year to regulate, like, because you're so new to it. And 
it's so easy to trade away your future picks. Like, I want to get rid of my first second for good players. And then the rookie draft comes around, and you're like, fuck, I wish I had my picks. It takes one, it takes one time to learn that fucking lesson. Yeah. But it's like everyone needs a year to regulate that. Because when the Drake Mays go off the board and you're like, man, rookie picks are kind of cool, yeah. actually. Like, I, I could really use that right now. Then you don't do that same shit again. Then everybody's like, I'm never trading my first round pick. <laughs> well, then that, that, I mean, it regulates the market. It's like yeah. first round picks are really fucking valuable, yeah. you know? And you, yeah. don't, you don't think about it because, like, in fantasy football, you're in one year time lapses mm. in your mind, so you're not thinking about three, four years down the line. Speaking of rookie picks. No you. No you. People <laughs> not understanding the hit rates of those seconds, thirds, fourth round rookie picks. Those are like once in a lifetime picks. You might hit on a good guy every once in a while, but it could be four or five years before you actually have anybody of value come through in that third or fourth round again. Yep. So like understanding it's not easy despite how fantasy Twitter makes it look. Yeah, like you can't just find Puka Nakua every year. That's one, not possible. One dude in your entire league found Puka Nakua in the fourth round. And he didn't even mean to hit on Puka Nakua. Exactly. So like understanding that if you have to throw that third round pick or that fourth round pick to get a deal done or do things like that, like it really isn't that valuable. The likelihood of you hitting on something of value at that pick is not very high. So like don't overvalue those later picks in those rookie drafts. I really like the idea of moving two second round picks for something like people love second round picks and they're valuable. Like you see it and you're like, Ooh, I like that second round pick. A lot of times you could double up two second round picks for like a really good player that you know is going to produce for you. Yep. And again, the hit rate on second round picks probably drops from like 60% in the first round down to like 40%. So you might be hitting on one of those picks that you have. You know what I mean? And like, even if you hit, it might be like a low end wide receiver two kind of thing. So like moving to like Stefan Diggs, I think there's a world where you're able to move two second round picks and maybe some player, some like younger player. For Stefan Diggs. Dude, I feel like the way people are talking about him right now, you could move a second round pick and get him. If you have like the 201, the yeah. 201 and like Kendra Miller, the 201 or like some young guy with like promise could get that done. Two second rounders who might turn into some shit. I, he, I like that. And move. even if you're getting like top 20 numbers out of Diggs next year and top 25 numbers the next year, that's probably more valuable than that guy you would have took in that second round. Likely, yeah. I think to the point of second and first round picks, in the beginning, most people don't realize when you try to go sell – the majority of players on your team, there are, I would say, almost, I would say a high majority of players are in between really being worth a first-round pick. And, like, I won't, like, if you got a first-round pick for this player, you're immediately going to take the first-round pick. But the second-round pick is not nearly enough for that player. And not really being able to understand that, like, there's a big difference between what is perceived as a first-round pick and what's perceived as a second-round pick and kind of being frustrated and just stuck with the difference of that. Super. F- the, I would say, like, 80% of players <laughs> fall into that, like, I wouldn't accept anything less than a first, but no one wants to give me yeah. a second. When you it, said that, I thought Terry McLaurin. <laughs> that there, there's, there's, I'm telling you, there's, like, there's dozens of players. I think that, of pretty much every bold. quarterback from, like, quarterback 18 down to like 28 it's like yeah it's like Derek Carr it's like I don't really want to give up a first for him but like I'm also I wouldn't sell him for a second you know what I mean like most players fall into that and on that point like it's also okay not to trade players like if you got a good feeling about a player and don't want it everyone's always like every player has a price like sure if you're gonna offer me four first for any player cool there's some dudes I go into a year with but I'm like I don't really care what people offer me I want to see this shit play out sure yeah yeah you know you can definitely have your guy I, I think it's important just to have you don't have to actually move every player, but just have an idea of, like, this is what the overpay would look like to move this mm-hmm. player. Kind of like, if I was to trade them, what would that look like? You can definitely have guys that you hold on to, and you can have guys especially that, like, you're only going to get a second-round pick for them right now. You're not willing to cash out at that price, and that's okay if that's what the market is. You yeah, want to see like, it through. I'm okay. Like, if I'm like, I, this is the guy I want, someone sends me a trade where I'm, f- I'm clearly winning, I'm fine rejecting it. Sure. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, you don't have to make any trade. And yeah, you can be bullish on, on a specific player. It's not a problem. At the same time, when you are acquiring a player, have some type of expectation for what is that player is going to be to your dynasty lineup. Like, don't just blindly be buying players. I think you should have a need, have a reason, have a outcome for that player on your lineup. That way you kind of are setting yourself an expectation of a ceiling and a floor for what that player could be for you. Yeah, I think actually uh, kind of like rounding this whole point into something you were talking about in the startups. I don't care if you're in a lineup start nine league, a lineup start 10 league, a lineup start 12 league. It doesn't really matter. A lot of times it's easy and people want to tear up and kind of consolidate, right? And I think it's okay to do that at spots. But just understand if you consolidate every single trade over and over and over again, you're going to end up with a very top-heavy roster that has no room for air and depth. 
And that's like a really, really bad position to be in a dynasty if you do it too often. So just be cognizant of how often you're actually consolidating assets to trade up. Be picky. Bars. Well, that is every mistake that's ever been made in any dynasty league that's in particular ever by Andrew existed. But the biggest mistake that you can make is not subscribing to the BDG Dynasty channel, not subscribing mm-hmm. to both Adam and Andrew's channels, both linked down below. No more dynasty on the redraft channel. So go to the dynasty channel. Subscribe. Hit the button that looks like this. Get and a we t-shirt. Will see y'all. Get a t-shirt or win a free t-shirt. Either Level way. up. Level Hank. up. We're out of here. Hank. See you later this week. Bice. Wow.